Uh, thanks everybody for getting on with me. This has really been a labor of love with respect to beginning to circle this idea of traumatic brain injury uh, from the integrative side of things. And it really opened my eyes to how I look at this topic. And I, I think you'll see that I'm going to wander into some other, other territories that you might not have thought of, but they all really do overlap. And just as a background, I own a medical practice in Northern Virginia, and I spent 16 years at the University of Michigan, and now more recently direct the integrated medicine program at, at George Washington University. But in my clinical practice, I was seeing a lot of patients with cognitive issues, memory loss, word finding difficulties, mood instability. Some of them had a background of concussion or maybe even TBI. We have a disproportionately large military population fr from that region of the country. But it opened a door in terms of asking the question, what am I really looking at? And it turned out, to sort of fast forward to the answer, that a lot of these patients have had biotoxic exposures, meaning they've been living in moldy environments or they had a tick-borne illness or they had a chronic infection of some sort. And the worst patients that I was seeing were the ones that also had a history of traumatic brain injury. Usually these were either athletes or, or um, uh, military personnel or maybe someone who had an unfortunate event. And so it got our research group thinking about this whole model of how do we understand TBI, and is it even in some ways too narrow for the way, uh, the way it should be approached. So this, is, this talk is a reflection of, of my journey in that regard. So traumatic brain injury, it's, it is an injury to the head from a blunt or penetrating object. And the injury is actually from the movement that the head, the head undergoes. So you get the sloshing back and forth of the brain inside the skull, and you get this stretching and twisting motion of the tissue of the brain, which really is where the insult occurs. We also know that the, the head actually tolerates a, a head-on trauma much better, even if it's a significant force, than lateral trauma. So you can have uh, small pounds of force with a high lateral velocity of motion that creates significant more injury and damage to the brain than um, a head-on head trauma. Um, we think that brain injury is, is uh, somewhat of a silent epidemic. Um, it's a major health problem. It often goes unrecognized. Um, and uh, it's mostly because many individuals just don't know that they've sustained some level of brain injury, uh, let alone its consequences or impact on uh, how they feel in their, in their behavior. Usually minor blows to the head or concussions are often not perceived as brain injuries, yet 15% of these individuals will have chronic problems plus injury. Um, and they're good mechanisms to understand why that is. I would also say, too, that oftentimes TBI happens in a broader context. And that's where the power of the integrative model, I think, really begins to shine to say, well, certainly the brain has sustained a direct event, but there can be also a number of other secondary and tertiary events that can make the situation even worse for the individual. Most people assume one needs to lose consciousness to have a brain injury, and that's certainly not true. Um, and the scope of the problem is huge. You know, we're talking, you know, over 5 million Americans, 2% of the population. 2 million sustain a brain injury every year. It happens every 15 seconds. It's the leading cause of death until age 44. Can you believe that? It's the number one reason for mortality in that um, age population. And it's the fourth leading cause of death overall. And every day, 5,500 individuals sustain a TBI, half of which occur from vehicle crashes. And then there are minority from sports and recreation, firearms, and falls. The firearms are a very interesting one. I work with a TBI expert in the military, uh, Josh Duckworth. And what he's found is that just by being near the concussive event of repetitive firing of a weapon over time, creates a load on the brain that results in a, a chronic traumatic brain injury, and then, of course, falls as well. But, you know, the, the, it can be um, a, a number of factors that lead to the TBI event in the way that the head takes the blow. So it can be from an object. It can be sh shaking of an infant, for example. It can be from a fall or even strangulation near drowning, firearms, a blow to the head like a punch and then, of course, being pushed against a, a solid object like a wall. So broken down by age, there are actually three peaks at age uh, below 5, 15 to 24, and then over 70. And the maximum peaks uh, occur between the 15 to 24 age range and the 65 and plus. Males are twice as likely than females to sustain a brain injury, and the highest rate is between 15 to 24 uh, because of risk 
risk-taking behavior. We tend to focus on the moderate to severe category. Uh, this is the 15% where typically people are hospitalized or usually quote-unquote identified as TBI, and they're known and followed by the medical community. There's a much bigger population of individuals, about 85% of all TBIs, that may be seen in an ER or an MD office, and they're identified quote-unquote as a concussion. Um, and they're usually not followed by the medical community. This is the population I get really worried about. When you broaden the model of how we understand the ways in which the brain can take insults, it's, it's not just a vector force or concussive event, but there could be other things going on in the patient's lives that multiply logarithmically the effect on brain health and, and its ability to repair itself. In the moderate to severe TBI category, uh, usually there's a documented loss of consciousness, there could be a potential for skull fractures, a significant period of days to weeks of a coma even. That's a very small portion of the population. And there's often loss of information for a period of time post-event and significant and chronic thinking, uh, physical and emotional changes. So uh, all of this is sort of well recognized in the moderate to severe category. How patients express TBI, though, we can group into either physical or psychological symptoms. Yes, there can be presence of unconsciousness. Headache is also a signal event. Repeated nausea and vomiting is also a worrying sign. Dizziness, uh, seizures, weakness, numbness, dilated pupils. Uh, this is for the more severe. And then uh, individuals can have persistent psychological symptoms. So slurring of speech, confusion, agitation, memory or uh, uh, concentration problems, and then amnesia. So what happens in this TBI event? Well, these nerve fibers that are within specific regions of the brain are severed never to be regained, so that's in the most worrying of circumstances. And in other instances, they're just stretched and strained, and you get this sort of torquing effect that's occurring across the brain. And this establishes a whole cascade of metabolic events that are really the culprit uh, for the individual over time. And as a result, you have an onset of physical, cognitive, and behavioral changes after the TBI reflecting impairment. Uh, impaired functioning uh, due to these broken or stretched nerve fibers. So it's the sloshing of the brain inside the skull and bouncing off the, the interior and the stretching and lengthening and, and torsion effect that we get from the concussive event. Um, you can also get bruising as well. And the twisting is really one of the most um, important components as these nerve fibers are, are injured and can lead to either temporary or permanent brain injury. In terms of the type of injury, there's primary and secondary. So in a primary event, it's the mechanical force itself, which occurs at the moment of injury, and the two main mechanisms that cause this injury as the object is striking the inside of the skull and the, the acceleration, deceleration. And, and a lot of researchers talk about the acceleration, deceleration phenomenon, that it's, it's both together that is sort of the sum total of the primary injury to the brain. So whiplash, for example, as the head strikes the windshield or the steering wheel, and then it, it stops the forward motion of the head, and then you get this rebound effect with the deceleration. My work is primarily focused on the secondary injury. This is not mechanically induced, and it may be delayed from the moment of impact, and it could be superimposed injury on a brain that's already been affected by the mechanical injury. So I want you to think about inflammation, that we go from a force phenomenon to a metabolic phenomenon. And so as we transition from this notion of a head that's been struck to a brain that is now inflamed and it can't turn off that inflammation, that's the problem with the ongoing symptoms of, of TBI. We have a lot to say from our perspective in that integrative approach to deal with the oxidative stress and the chronic inflammation that can be established because of the secondary phenomenon. And in particular, it's generated by the microglial cells of the brain, which are the innate immune cells. You can think of them as macrophages in the brain. And they upregulate, they change their phenotype in the setting of an injury or trauma, and they start spitting out cytokines and other inflammatory markers. And once these microglial turn on, they have a hard time turning off. And so you get this acute on chronic inflammation because of the activity of these microglial cells. And so unfortunately what happens is as the microglial cells activate and produce their neurotoxic factors, there can be direct injury to the dendrite. And as the dendrite becomes impaired with architectural changes and even potentially cell death, this feeds back 
to further stimulate microglial cells in the brain. So we always need to be thinking about how do we turn off microglial activation in the central nervous system after a traumatic event. And unfortunately, this chronic microglial activation can become somewhat persistent over time. So not only does it create changes in key centers in the brain with dendritic problems, but we also see degradation of blood-brain barrier. So now you're losing your architectural protection. So there's a chance for toxins and vectors and antigens to get into the brain to further stimulate it. Think of it as just like antibiotics can establish a leaky gut uh, situation, you can establish a leaky brain situation with a traumatic brain injury. And so um, even though we think about vector forces across the brain tissue, once you start losing integrity of the blood-brain barrier, it establishes a milieu in which the brain can get worse and worse and worse. So as much as we worry about cleaning up the gut and sealing up the gut lining, we also need to think about how do I, how do I protect the blood-brain barrier um, because once that starts to degrade, just like in the gut, we get even more immunologic drive. And so we're very focused on all of these issues um, in this patient population. The end result then is you have this chronic inflammation, upregulation of microglial cells, which leads to neuronal damage and death, neurobehavioral impairment, and chronic neurodegenerative conditions. This can be a mess for patients. Um, and you think about what are all the forces that could be working across brain tissue, and how does that result? Well, there's really only so many ways for the brain to respond to these insults and injuries, but we can see this through the, the classic symptoms of TBI, but also this chronic inflammation plays a role in a variety of conditions and illnesses related to the brain, from TIA and aging to memory loss and Alzheimer's, learning difficulties, even seizures, movement disorders such as Parkinson's and Huntington's, uh, and ALS, uh, neurodevelopmental problems such as autism, uh, certainly psychiatric conditions, that's a big uh, comorbid uh, condition uh, in TBI patients when they have chronic inflammation, MS, and, and even diabetes. So um, we know that um, in a, in a, a well-studied population like football players, uh, when you look at repeated blood-brain barrier disruption, um, uh, this was a nice study that was done uh, that showed uh, that serum S100B uh, levels increased uh, because of disruption of the blood-brain barrier, which uh, typically occurs in football players even when concussions are not diagnosed. So our results suggest that uh, these levels of S100B trigger production of autoantibodies that may constitute a risk factor for premature neurodegeneration. So think about that. Even when an individual is not diagnosed as concussed, they can still have a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier now you're getting excess immunologic drive. Again, think of this as a leaky gut situation, but it's happening in, in and around the brain that further stimulates neuroinflammation and ultimately neurodegeneration. Because if you inflame the brain long enough, you can get architectural changes. So this neuroinflammation is something that we really want to identify and control if possible. Some inflammation is good, chronic inflammation is bad. And there can be a variety of uh, reasons why individuals have this ongoing neuroinflammation. Um, it can be from a concussive event, but it also can be from pathogens. It can be from toxins. It can be from antigens, from food or exposures to chemicals and heavy metals, um, and even a byproduct of, of disease itself. So this is where we get into the broader modeling of integrative medicine. It's not just was this brain concussed but what are all of the other factors that might be present that are further stimulating the neuroinflammation? So certainly TBI is a major one that we worry about from sports and military activity and MBAs and uh, even electric shocks and lightning strikes and violence, but also the presence of more systemic either immune dysfunction, chronic inflammation, or autoimmune conditions will worsen uh, the TBI picture, and all of this can lead to that neuronal de uh, degradation. So again, all of this is orchestrated by the microglial cells, but there are other immune factors involved, such as astrocytes, macrophages, macrophages and flamasomes, mast cells, toll-like receptors. Uh, there's a lot of targets now that are being identified, and if you were to take a look at the list of the potential uh, metabolites that now can be measured that are being produced in the brain as a result of injury, I think you'd be overwhelmed. It's a whole new nomenclature uh, for how we take a look at the secondary consequence from the original injury, which is this, 
storm of inflammation that's occurring in the brain. One of the major overlaps that I, I do want to point out is the role that stress plays uh, in this population. You cannot underestimate uh, the impact that ongoing either overwhelming stress or chronic stress can have on the brain. And we often see the TBI and the PTSD or chronic stress being part of the same axis or pattern of injury. Sometimes it's just co-located. Sometimes the state of being TB in TBI uh, just creates stress in the individual, which further harms the brain. Bruce McEwen did a lot of the original work on understanding the stress response and its impact on the central nervous system. He talked about the load of stress, meaning allostatic load, and how um, the body sort of activates a variety of mechanisms that um, not only help to try and manage that stress, but sometimes becomes maladaptive and can injure uh, the brain itself. So in terms of the normal reactions to stress, uh, we perceive it, we have behavioral responses, either adaptive or maladaptive. The body also responds to stress, up, upregulating not just cortisol and, and neurotransmitters, but also the cardiovascular system um, and the immune system. And then uh, all of this sort of um, is modulated through individual differences, whether it's genes or epigenetics or prior personal history or uh, developmental issues. Um, and, and all of this then feeds back to the brain itself. A normal stress response, we upregulate and downregulate, but over time uh, the body can degrade in its ability to respond to stress normally. Um, and interestingly, there are some patients where in the lower left-hand box you can see an upregulation with persistent cortisol production, meaning the body has a hard time turning it off. And uh, we have another population where they don't mount an appropriate stress response. In colloquial terms, we may call this adrenal fatigue. I think that's a real misnomer because as the body's downregulating its stress response, there's a variety of mechanisms that are occurring simultaneously to get the body into this state that really have nothing to do with adrenal function itself. One of the main ways that um, um, we, we get into this, uh, what we call a low allostatic load state, meaning the body can't respond to stress anymore, is because of the role that cortisol plays in key centers in the brain, such as the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the hippocampus in particular being the main regulator of the stress response, and cortisol will light up the hippocampus, and then it starts to shrink and shrivel and die. In the same way that cortisol will activate local microglial cells, and that, too, injures the hippocampus. And as the hippocampus starts to change in its conformation, uh, the brain says enough is enough, and it starts to downregulate the stress response. And so we can injure the brain, not from a vector force like TBI, but from overwhelming stress. But the end result, the final pathways are almost identical. Um, there's a consequence to this, though, and I want you to think about it. In the beginning, I talked about neuroinflammation, that chronic inflammation in the brain is the, is the underlying engine of injury that occurs over time. Well, think about this. Take someone who's had a TBI, and then you give them a stressful event, and the brain says, enough is enough. I'm turning down the stress response. Well, cortisol, among other properties, is also the main regulator of the immune system. So when cortisol levels are high, the immune system tends to be suppressed. What do you think happens when the brain has said, I don't want any more cortisol being produced because my brain has already changed in the hippocampus and the cortex and the amygdala? So it starts to turn down cortisol production. So you get these patients with these very flat cortisol curves. Well, what do you think happens in the immune system? It's upregulated. So now you have greater baseline activity of microglial cells, macrophages, inflammatory activity overall, so IL-6 and TNF-alpha and CRP tends to be higher on baseline. So one of the best ways to further injure the brain after a concussive event is to turn down cortisol because it releases the immune system and actually causes further injury. So these repeated stressful events begin to change those key centers uh, in the hippocampus and other areas. So not only do we lose memory, but we also lose control of the stress response itself, and so the immune system becomes more inflamed. And so these two phenomena tend to be two sides of the same coin, the TBI and stressful events. So we know there's volume loss in PTSD, depression, Cushing syndrome, and it's all the effects of, of hippocamp hippocampal atrophy. So we see shrinkage and dendritic retraction in key centers such as the CA3 and CA1 region 
in individuals that have PTSD. When you look at the overlap with individuals with TBI, it's extraordinary. And interestingly, if you just do a PubMed search on TBI, PTSD, and autoimmune illnesses, as you lose control of the immune system and the patient's baseline levels of inflammation are higher, they have a much greater likelihood to mount an autoimmune process like MS or lupus or so on and so forth. So all these pieces come together. So not only does the patient take a blow to the head, and they may also have a stressful event that's turned down cortisol and they've released the immune system so they have higher levels of chronic inflammation, now they're predisposed to autoimmune processes on top of it. It's an extraordinary phenomenon. It's not just about stretching the brain tissue itself. It's all of these secondary and tertiary consequences that are occurring in this patient population. So one of the ways the brain protects itself is by reducing uh, surface area from these excitotoxic effects of NMDA receptors and, and glucocorticoid receptors. So why am I talking about cortisol? Well, because if you have someone who's had a TBI, usually they have abnormal cortisol patterns. This is an, a, a normal cortisol curve. This is someone who can't turn off their cortisol, so they're, they're literally frying their brain. This is someone who's starting to change their cortisol pattern, and this is someone who has a low allostatic load, they've liberated their immune system, and it's directly further harming the brain itself. So when you look at the literature on the relationship between stress and the immune system, it's two sides of the same coin. And if we think about the role that we play as practitioners in terms of protecting the brain, if you have someone who's had a concussive event, you better be looking at their stress response. Because as cortisol levels drop and the systemic inflammation increases, all that's happening is there's further injury to the central nervous system. Because now we have greater microglial activation, we also have uh, increased serotonin degradation in the digestive tract and nonspecific symptoms of sickness. When you look at the global symptom picture of patients with TBI and a history of multiple concussions, they talk about achiness, fatigue, depression, loss of concentration, and metabolically, they're more inflamed, they have greater hormone imbalances, they have gut dysfunction. It's because all these pieces are connected together. And one of the strengths of an integrative approach is we like to look at all of these pieces. In addition to that, I had mentioned that sometimes we can injure the brain because of vectors or infections. Well, think about this. Sometimes the body does this on purpose where if it's dealing with a chronic infection, the person's physiology will actually turn down the stress response to liberate the immune system, to free bodily defenses from inhibitory control of cortisol to face this ongoing infectious threat. Thus, an enhanced release may be beneficial for health and survival. So most strikingly, the demonstration of a low allostatic load index, meaning low cortisol levels, in chronically stressed subjects protects those subjects against the harmful effects of the high allostatic load index, meaning the body is now dealing with an immune threat. What does it do? It actually turns down the stress response. So sometimes you see patients with low cortisol patterns because they have an infection, they may have toxins, they could have a concussive event, and they have ongoing stress. It's this incredible mix of problems. So here's one model that we use to sort of look at all of these in, uh, this interrelatedness. Stress influences the central nervous system. We know it has indirect and direct effects on creating leakiness, permeability essentially, in the digestive tract itself. So now we have greater antigen presentation that creates systemic inflammation that influences the central nervous system. So we have a, a, a brain-gut immune phenomenon that's mediated by stress. If you throw TBI into the mix, it's even worse. So remember I talked about how the blood-brain barrier starts to break down. Well, what happens when the gut barrier starts to break down? The body is more <laughs> systemically inflamed, but this also affects the central nervous system too. As the gut becomes inflamed, we have upregulation of indolamines. So now we activate the quinolinic acid pathway in the digestive tract shunting tryptophan away from serotonin production, and this has been linked to neurodegeneration and major depression. So as the gut becomes more inflamed, the brain suffers. So you can further injure the brain from stress. You can further injure the brain from vectors. You can further injure the brain from leaky gut, and you can further injure the brain because of production of excess quinolinic acid. And so this typically all happens in this patient population. 
presence of food antigens, upregulation of indolamine, production of lipopolysaccharides from bacterial fragments in the gut, meaning dysbiosis. What about systemic inflammation, problems in the innate immune system because biotoxin exposure, or what about autoimmune problems, um, and, and then also microglial activation. These all create pressure on the brain itself. You get neuroexcitation, which ultimately leads to neurodegeneration and alterations in structural plasticity. So you can shake the brain, but if the body is also sick, the outcome is even worse. And we see this over and over and over in our patient population. So here's this model that I'm talking about. TBI gets your attention because it's a dramatic concussive event. Stress and PTSD worsens the situation, especially as you get these large immune shifts, in addition to the load on the brain from cortisol itself. And then when we add in exposures like biotoxins, such as infections or molds, or antigens from the gut if they have a leaky gut situation, or they've been exposed to pollutants. Imagine a combat vet. I take care of a lot of Navy SEALs. They sustain two-thirds of their TBI from the training itself because they're around uh, high-caliber weapons uh, in a very intense way for long periods of time, more than most other special operators. In addition to that, they sustain significant stress because of their combat duties and also because of where they operate and live. They're generally exposed to biotoxins. Their guts are broken down. They um, tend to encounter lots of pollutants when they're operating in other parts of the world. And you could imagine the load on the brain as a result of all of these pressures and threats. It's not just the concussive event. It's everything else that's happening around it and the consequence of chronic neuroinflammation that we have to manage and manage aggressively. So how do I protect the brain? What do I do? What are some simple things that you can do to manage this issue? Well, not only do you want to decrease this chronic inflammation and oxidative stress, but we want to try and do things to induce adult neurogenesis, meaning production of new neurons in the adult brain, which actually is possible. So it's, it follows a complex multi-step process. It starts with progenitor cells, and it ends with a fully functioning neuron integrated into um, the hippocampal network or other, other networks of the brain. So we have evidence that the brain can heal even after uh, multiple events and threats. So what are mediators of this process? Well, stress and sleep disruption actually suppress adult neurogenesis. And conversely, decreasing stress and improving sleep will improve adult neurogenesis. Stress interferes with all stages of neuronal renewal and inhibits both proliferation and survival. So you cannot have a patient who's had a TBI event who's also under lots of stress. You've got to go deep into their stress management uh, uh, toolkit and make sure that they're developing coping skills and emotional resiliency and teaching them breathing techniques and movement therapies and anything you can do to modulate that stress response. The, because the problem is you can get lasting inhibition of adult neurogenitor cells even after a single stressor, meaning that you can turn off the brain's ability to repair and heal if they've already had a stressful event. So we have to do everything we can to improve this uh, phenomenon. So when do I intervene? So let's say you have an individual that you're suspecting of a concussion or, or traumatic brain injury. Well, all the data suggests the sooner the better. The more you can intervene and turn off that microglial activation, turn off those astrocytes, get that inflammation and oxidative stress under control, the better. There's even some data that suggests that taking fish oil before an event is protective. So if you have someone who's operating in, a, in an environment in which the likelihood is, is higher than baseline for sustaining a concussion, they should be on some anti-inflammatories at baseline. The clinical key is to reduce oxidative stress and inflammation while inducing neurogenesis. Uh, so most conventional therapies in the TBI world are targeted at cognitive rehab, but in addition, they're starting to bring in things like acupuncture, meditation, yoga, and there's even some data on light activity uh, to help, to help re-regulate the immune system. And if areas in the CNS develop atrophy over time, it's much harder to treat, meaning uh, we can begin to see structural changes in the brain. Uh, usually it's areas of shrinkage. We hope that uh, this phenomenon is what we call dendritic pruning, meaning the brain has shrunk, but with adequate therapy, it can regrow and heal. Conversely, the brain can go down a different path called atrophy, which is essentially scarring of areas of the brain. And in traumatic brain injury, it's usually the, the frontal lobe and temporal lobe. 
Um, and if it's atrophy, that's much harder to deal with because you're trying to repair a scar, which can be near impossible. So what are some things that you can do to protect the brain? Well, ginkgo is very good because it improves uh, cerebrovascular circulation. It oxygenates the brain. It improves glucose metabolism to get nutrients right into the cells where they need it. It improves nerve transition and mental alertness and prevents free radical damage and helps repair synapses. So the oxidative stress you want to get under control, ginkgo is one of your choices in that regard. We know it improves memory loss, brain function, depression, cerebral and peripheral circulation by dilating microcapillaries. The cerebral, cerebrovascular insufficiency, resistant depression elderly, in the elderly, early Alzheimer's and dementia patients, tinnitus, intermittent claudication, impotence, and macular degeneration have all been studied in ginkgo, but it's one of its most important properties is that it protects and reactivates reactivation of brain neuronal synaptic receptors. So it's very good at decreasing oxidative stress. There are lots and lots of studies on ginkgo. It's widely available, and it's incredibly neuroprotective. You'd want to get patients on this right away. In addition, glutathione is an interesting compound. So studies have recently shown that administering glutathione after concussion reduces brain tissue damage by an average of 70%. So in a clinical setting, glutathione can be given IV. Oral supplements, of course, don't work very well, but you can also induce glutathione production through oral supplementation. So vitamin C, selenium, niacinamide, N-acetylcysteine being the big one, and even broccoli extracts with sulfurophane. I use a lot of N-acetylcysteine in this patient population. 500 milligrams twice a day as a precursor to glutathione. We know glutathione levels drop in the brain the more it's becoming injured. So you want to boost glutathione levels, which helps to induce repair. In addition, magnesium levels drop in this patient population. It's one of the best nutrients for speeding recovery from concussion and preventing delayed brain injury and post-concussion syndrome. It reduces inflammation and raises glutathione in cells. And after concussion, the levels of magnesium in the brain drop by 50%, and they can stay that low for, for five days uh, before slowly returning to pre-concussion levels. So you can give them, you know, 500, I'm sorry, 300 milligrams twice a day, up to 500 milligrams. Curcumin as an anti-inflammatory, well-studied concussion reduces brain inflammation, and also it helps to repair membrane damage in the neuron. And what it also does, which is really great, is that it stimulates BDNF which is sort of brain food, so it induces adult neurogenesis. So it can also be helpful um, because of its multiple anti-inflammatory mechanisms, and I would do 500 milligrams twice a day. One of the west, uh, best known studied is fish oil, so omega-3s, very helpful in reducing inflammation from a concussion to help rebuild the cell membrane, protect the mitochondria, and decrease inflammation overall, and DHA in particular has also been shown to increase BDNF levels. During the first three weeks of a concussion recovery period, you want to do up to 4,000 milligrams daily of EPA and DHA. That's usually split 2,000 twice a day. And then you can con uh, continue that until they start feeling better and reduce that uh, after several months. In addition to that, you really want to work to regulate the, the immune system. And we have some, some very interesting products in that regard. So uh, it turns out there's a whole body of literature on thymic protein extract. So the thymus gland is responsible for uh, maturing T lymphocytes in particular. So T lymphocytes uh, migrate to the, to the thymus, and that's where they, they are trained and gain their potency. It turns out that if you give thymic protein extract, basically it's a, a gland from the thymus, bovine thymus, uh, this also has a very potent effect on maturing T cells and modulating immune function. And there's a whole interesting body of literature on the role that thymic protein extract can play or thymus gland extract in a variety of immune conditions. We use it specifically because of its ability to re-regulate the immune system. It helps to ward off infections. It reduces chronic inflammation. It's been studied in a variety of situations, even in exercise-induced immune suppression, because it works as a modulator. So it, it helps to support if it's too low and it helps to rein in if it's, if it's too high. I also use a lot of L-theanine in my practice. L-theanine is a green tea extract. Um, it's a potent antioxidant. It's known for its relaxing uh, properties. I like it because it's an antagonist to NMDA receptors. It reduces norepi and epi levels. It helps to reduce blood pressure, and it suppresses the effects of, of caffeine. It's very calming to the brain, uh, but it also improves dopamine um, and GABA levels. So it's... Um, stimulating, at least improves concentration. So when you think about a patient who's had a TBI, they tend to be wired and unfocused. And so theanine helps to calm the edges 
and begin to uh, rein in that, that chronic inflammation. It also induces an alpha wave state in the brain, which is a meditative-like state. And you can do, you know, 50 to 200 milligrams two to four times a day. You can even go higher than that. Theanine is incredibly safe. You can probably do 400 milligrams three times a day uh, if you really need to. Max dose, at least in the U.S., is 1,200. In Japan, there really is no upper limit of safety on, on theanine. You can, you can bathe in this stuff, and it wouldn't hurt you. So the bottom line in your concussion patients is that you want to intervene early. You want to get anti-inflammatories on board as well as antioxidants. And you want to start modulating that immune system right away so they don't spill over into chronic inflammation. While you're doing that, once you've captured that patient, you've got to look at other domains and areas that might worsen the conditional state. What's their stress response like? What's their gut like? Have they had exposures and toxins? Do they have vectors and mold in their environment? You've got to start looking at the milieu in which the brain could be even further inflamed and injured. That's where the magic is, and that's where I think um, our community really shines, because we don't just think about the vector force across the brain. We think about all of the secondary and tertiary metabolic forces that could be accumulating that patient as well. We have a lot of tools at our disposal to do that. Uh, much better than just conventional. And in fact, there are very few medications that you can give a patient that I can write for as an MD to protect the brain, but I have a very large toolkit on the integrative side. So more and more, what we do is being recognized within the conventional TBI community uh, because we have so many good solutions at our disposal. Uh, but you want to inter intervene aggressively, and you really want to restore whole body health to protect the brain 